Hi! It's been a while since I've checked out my bees. I found out that they had a queen a few weeks ago. I thought it was dead and I came to clean out the box and there are bees in it. So, let's see how they're doing. They have two deep boxes which are where they lay their brood and store up honey for the winter. And hopefully, I'm gonna find a whole bunch of baby bees brood in here. But it looks pretty quiet on the second floor, but that's okay. It's the second floor. The second floor isn't usually very active. At least not this time of year. Um, many In the spring, many bee colonies will be in a single box. And I put them in two just because I have it. I've got the space and I can give them some extra honey. All right, so pretty empty up here. That's fine. And those are dead from a previous colony. So... I'm just going to take this whole second box off and hopefully there's going to be a hive of activity in the basement. <clears throat> yeah, moderate. They could be better. It's a fairly weak hive right now. This is my last remaining hive from my original stock of bees that I bought five years ago. I only ever bought one hive of bees and I split it into more and more bees and every winter some of them die and so every winter some of them survive and this winter I had unusually high die off. Let's see oh, what we have here. A little brood off in the corner. What the heck are they doing? Let's set this off to the side. Have a look and see where the rest of the brood is, because this is unusual. I kind of like to find the queen to confirm I have one. I don't always have to find the queen. M many times I can just look for fresh larva. But it could be that I have a laying worker, which happens sometimes when the queen dies. What the heck is going on here? This is a weird looking colony. I don't know what's going on. I wonder if the queen died. Which would be a real bummer right now. Since I don't have any other hives, I can't raise a new queen. So, it may not be possible to see on the screen, but there's a whole bunch of eggs in different cells. This tells me the queen probably died, and one of the workers, all the workers are female, started laying eggs, which sometimes happens. I think I have a laying worker. So now I have to get another queen. Dang it. It would have been nice to keep my original genetic live, line alive after this many years. It's a real, it's a real shame and kind of kicking the pants to lose them. Unfortunately for my beehives, uh, I think I finally lost my genetic line, which is a real bummer because I've been working to develop a treatment-free type of bees for years and uh, I just didn't have enough of them this year to survive and be able to split out. It's the first time in five years, so five years from one package of bees is pretty good record. So. I'm just gonna have to get some fresh bees from a neighbor and start all over again, but that's how it goes. Well, it's been another pretty busy week here. Uh, we've gotten a lot of garden beds into place. And while a lot of this does actually look pretty nice, which is kind of unusual for me, uh, I'll definitely show you some of the places that are not so nice because a lot of times online, you see all these like beautiful gardens and everything looks like it's perfect and it's not here for sure um, and I don't think they are either I just think you know you can frame the camera to avoid some of the uglier bits so why don't we take a quick tour through garden I'll show you some of that um, and later this episode we're going to see the chickens moving into their new spot we're gonna see what happened with the bees when I checked on them uh, we've got planting out of wheat planting out of oats 
and a few other things that you might want to check out. So, uh, so let's keep going through the garden here. So the, the peas, they're looking pretty good. And these beds are, are ready, but the problem is we have a big frost coming up at the end of the week, so I can't move my beans out or my other things. Um, I just really have to wait until this weekend, which is really late for us. Why don't we step back here behind the greenhouse where things have gotten a little bit uh, hairy. So I'll be the first to admit that it looks like a bomb went off behind my greenhouse. And while I got some greens and some lettuce here into this bed, up on top of here, and we've already gotten out a salad or two. Still not back to where I'd like it to be. There's a lot of scrap wood, and I'm just at a loss of a place to put it, so right now it's just kind of piling up here and getting blown over by the wind. Some pretty terrible wood anyway. One neat thing I've got. Is that the chicks are right here. And they haven't been outside yet, so I'm not gonna I'm not going to bring them out right now, uh, but this is going to be a playpen for the chicks here uh, probably next week, so we'll check back on that uh, in a future episode. Why don't we pop into the greenhouse and take a look at the starts? So my greenhouse is looking pretty good. My beans look great. They're really ready to be planted out, but like I said, it's going to freeze. Uh, cilantro, parsley, my greens are looking good. Got some cabbage here. My, yet again, I failed, I think on my onions and I do not know why. Um, I try and keep them wet, I try and keep them watered. Maybe I overwater them, I don't know. Um, and up here, I've got cabbages and broccolis, cauliflowers that are actually looking like plants that are gonna work. Um, here we've got cucumbers, they're ready to go in the greenhouse next door. And I have a whole bunch of lettuce ready to be planted out. I have so much stuff it's ready to be planted out, but with the coming freeze um, this weekend, I, I have to wait a little longer and they're kind of outgrowing their pots and I don't want to up-pot them because that's just so much work for, you know, just a couple of days. So hopefully they can hang on and it's not going to be too detrimental. So usually when we come in the greenhouse, I like to show you this side because it's got the, the plaster or the uh, cob wall um, and the and the um, shelves and things, but here, let me turn the camera around and you can see just the absolute pile of uh, unorganized stuff that there is in here. And again, I think it's important to show you uh, the good and the bad, so yeah, obviously this is not as organized or put together as I'd like it to be, but there's only so many hours in the day, unfortunately, and I probably take on too much, but that's another story. Uh, my fava beans are looking really good. I'm hoping to get them out soon because they are totally ready to go in the ground. Um, but I just can't do it until this freezes through. Now as I come out of the greenhouse and start moving back over here, this is a potato plot. And then over here, we've got a whole bunch of beds that need wood chips put down here on the pathways. So the beds are ready, they're ready to be planted, but I've got to wait until this frost comes through. I'm gonna have potatoes over there. I could probably get those in. Um, I've got carrots over here. Um, and then moving on this way, we have our raised beds. So right in here, I've got the potatoes that you saw me planting, uh, or that you will see me planting later in the video. And then we've got a couple more raised beds. There's my garlic. Um, but these definitely need to be rejuvenated uh, before I get planting in them. And if you follow me around a little farther, you can see these currants that we've planted out uh, some this year and some previous years. You can see the smothering that I'm doing um, and hopefully getting this barrier in or the berry area into shape. Uh, but if you look over here, it's a mess. This is a large area that I've grown potatoes in and I want to turn it into garden beds. One of the problems is this big tree that I don't want to take down, but it shades this whole area. It's got a lot of invasives and a lot of work for me to do. But this isn't even as bad as what I have over here, which is random fence, wood that I need to get under cover, brush that needs to be taken out of here. This is supposed to be garden space and it's not. Uh, so I need to get on it or we're not gonna have enough space to grow food to provide for us this winter. So this used to be our chicken coop. When we first moved here, uh, the back of our garage had this little shed type thing built on the back of it. I thought, perfect, this will be a great chicken coop. Um, and it was, and, but uh, as you've seen in other videos probably, and I'll link to it here, uh, I built a timber frame chicken coop and they live out in the back half of the yard now. Uh, they have a lot more space, they're not in our garden, it's just better for everybody all around. But I've got this great space that I've been using 
as a storage area. So now what I'm going to do, because the chickens on the inside of the house are starting to produce enough uh, excrement that they stink, uh, I'm going to move them outside. So uh, I need to clear out enough space to put eight little pullets in here. Well that was less painful than I thought. So I've got some old screens here uh, to keep the chicks off of my uh, off of my stored stuff. I built them a, a more improved, a larger roost for them as they're getting larger. And the really cool thing about this, although I got a really great chicken door um, behind all this stuff over here that rises and falls from when this was a chicken coop, um, I also, uh, even though that's inaccessible right now, I've got this thing which is a little bit of space where it opens up right to the back uh, yard behind the greenhouse. And so what I'll be able to do each day as they get older is open this up and I'll put screens off on the side so that they um, are safe from uh, running away and running into raccoons or other things that might eat them. Uh, but they'll have some unfettered outside time each day which is going to be really exciting I think for them. Uh, it is fun to watch them the first time after they've been living in a box for their entire lives. Uh, to see the sun, to come outside to eat clover, which is what I'll have for them to eat, um, and just to dig around the dirt. It's a, it's a fun experience to see them seeing that for the first time. Unfortunately, since I'm not a mother hen, I can't take them out as soon as they're born like the mother would be able to, but we do what we can. And now there's just a few things left to do. First of all, bedding. Ugh. Got a whole bunch of shredded newspaper, or shredded paper, for the ground here. Just so they're not on the cold concrete, but they have something to dig through and run around in. I've got my old chicken feeder, which I made years ago. I now have a bigger feeder in the coop. I'm going to use this one for young chicks. Now we just have the water. And the new chick habitat is all ready to go. Just need some chicks. I'll get the school bus. Our patented chicken transport. It's actually a cat carrier. It's certainly fun to have chickens in your house for a little while. But as they grow older, they grow stinkier. So what I'm going to do now is put them into the chicken transport. Ooh, this one's got nice barred rocks that might have interesting coloring. Let's go to your new home. Moving day. Let there be light. Come on. Who's the brave one? Come on. Chickens out of the bus? Nope. Uh, there we go. All the chickens are out of the bus. So here in the back 40, I've got my beans planted this week, and I have peas that are coming up, uh, just growing up through the mulch here, and I'll have to put some strings and trellis for them to grow on pretty soon and if we come over here I've got potatoes growing in these rows under here under mulch and compost here I have my flax that's just uh, starting to sprout I see some uh, some flax starting to come up here and it will overtop all of these weeds pretty quickly and if we go this way you can see where I have solarized some of what's going to be the corn patch and so this is using old plastic to uh, heat up and dry out the ground underneath it and this kills a lot of the weed load. Behind me you can see the hoop house where I've got tomatoes planted like you saw last week and on this side these are all the community potatoes that we put in to share with our neighbors uh, later this fall when things get even tougher. And then just yesterday I put oats in this whole quarter of the, the garden plot. So this is going to be about three or four times more oats than I grew last year and hopefully I can keep the deer from getting them all again.
So I have a lot more I need to take care of this week and in the coming weeks. But in the world at large, things continue to move on. It's now May. Um, and our grocery shopping has really been cut down because not only are we running out of gas to be able to get to the grocery store, it's just getting so expensive, everything at the grocery store is starting to get expensive. And we can really only count on about a, buying a quarter of what we used to be able to buy because the prices have gone up so much. We're spending the same amount of money at the grocery store to get a quarter of what we used to be able to buy just because fossil fuels underwrote everything in our previous food system. And now in a new food system without fossil fuels, it's surprising how quickly we deplete everything we had. The grocery industry has been working under what's called the just-in-time model. So instead of having a warehouse full of bags of flour and different canned goods and all these things stockpiled, um, they've been shipping the directly from the manufacturer to, or the producer, to the grocery store. And what this does essentially is streamlines everything, but it also makes it more susceptible to hiccups because there's no slack in the system. There's not an extra couple of days worth of food sitting in a warehouse to be sent to the grocery store. It's just all coming directly from the manufacturer to the grocery. And when there is a disruption in that food chain, we feel it at the grocery store immediately. We don't have that safeguard to fall back on. And so what we're having to do with what we have here is to try and fill in the gaps. Time to plant some fingerling potatoes. There is chicken mulch in here from last fall. And the only problem is these cilia that I have to hoe down. And I'm gonna try and disturb the soil as little as possible and plant the potatoes mostly on the surface, cover them up with mulch. I'm planting these close to our house because these are fingerlings. We're gonna eat them throughout the summer. The ones that I planted in the last episode uh, or two episodes ago are over bigger field potatoes that won't be ready till the fall. As carefully as I can so I don't disturb these, these starts, I'm gonna drop these fingerling potatoes every foot. Well, I've gotta to get to work now because these are all invasives that reproduce prodigiously, it's garlic mustard. And you can make pesto out of it, but you can only eat so much garlic mustard pesto before you get sick of it. So this all has to come out. And all of, these are second year plants. I gotta find all the first year plants and I have to find all the plants that are just starting out this year. So this is just part of spring every year. It's gotten less and less, believe it or not, this is less than it was last year. This whole area we refer to as the barrier. So we've got a whole bunch of currants here. And behind me I've got apple trees, strawberries, raspberries. And we're going to make this into a perennial uh, fruit area. Uh, so i got to clean it out and then smother all of this vegetation because this is largely decorative slash invasive vegetation that needs I gotta move these logs out unfortunately these are walnut and walnut has a compound in it called uh, juglone that uh, doesn't allow other plants to grow so I can't rot these or burn them and then put them in the garden they have to be taken out of the garden or maybe used as the the edge of pathways here so last year I used some of this like carpet and other heavy matte, uh, opaque matte type stuff to smother different areas. So now what I'm gonna do is lift them up and see how they look underneath and hopefully I'll have pre pretty bare ground. Well, it's not quite bare but it's certainly very easy to take part and chop this stuff up. What I'm gonna do now is do the work this same magic over on this green area. My goal is to have an area that is uh, more weed free. We've got things like Creeping Charlie, which if you had Creeping Charlie in your yard, you know how frustrating it is to deal with. And a lot of other well-intentioned, but just 
ecologically aggressive uh, ornamentals back here. So they, these all gotta go. And then we can get uh, clover or some other uh, ground cover down that will work with our, our backyard system. The clover will be eaten by the chickens um, and put nitrogen back in the soil. So most beekeepers just keep their bees out in the open. But I built something similar to a Slovenian or a Swiss bee shed. Um, and so they actually go out through this small hole. But uh, I use American style, well, they're called Langstroth, uh, named after a French uh, clergy person, clergyman, who came up with this, uh, this system. But it's what's commonly used in the US. But I just put mine inside of my shed here. The problem is I put the bottom, the base that holds them right up against the wall. And then when I do inspections later in the year, the bees come out and they crawl up the wall and then I can't put the next box back. So I need to build in a space. So I'm gonna put this spacer there to keep the box, to give them a bit of a gap here. And then I'm gonna add a bit of box here to hold the back of the box. So basically, the box can come back three quarters of an inch and it'll just give me a little better work. The only good part about having a dead out, which is when a hive dies, is I can then take apart and refurbish and adjust what was or wasn't working uh, with the hive. So this is one change I'm gonna make. Now when I put a box on it, instead of running up straight against the wall, there we go. Now there's a bit of a gap there for the bees to be safe and they're not gonna crawl out the back. So there we go. Luckily my neighbor or a friend of mine who lives nearby had extra bees this year. And so he sold me what's called a nucleus colony, which is about five frames of bees with brood and honey and pollen. It's basically a mini colony. And this is one way to start your bees. I have enough resources that I could have just got a package, which is a box of bees. Um, you can see a whole video on how to install bees and how we're doing a research project. I'm, I'll link to that here. But um, this is what he had and I, I need to get my bees going. So that's what I purchased. And I probably don't need put my veil on, but I don't know these bees. I don't know if they're calm. They've just been driven across, oh, I don't know, a couple miles uh, to get here, and they've been stuck inside all day. So when I open this, they're probably gonna pop out pretty quick, uh, wondering why the heck they were closed up in there in the first place. So, eh, better safe than sorry. I'm gonna put my, my equipment on. Probably don't need it, but doesn't hurt anything. I actually realized I have a hole in my thumb. So I'm gonna have to make myself some new bee gloves. Not that it really matters. I don't think I'd get stung half the time I go in or... I've gone in without the veil and things on before when I had to and it wasn't as bad as I thought, but I don't know, it's like a safety blanket. All right, so let's see what we got here. Well, they're active. The main thing is I want to keep any brood fairly close together. Oops, sorry girls. So that they can keep it warm. So the population of this hive is about to explode when all these, when all these bees hatch. When it's capped, it's in the final stages of, of pupation. I don't know if pupation is a word. Oh, clumsy. That's the one thing about gloves. They do make you clumsier as a beekeeper. And I bet half the time my glove gets stung, it's because I'm wearing a glove. And if I had my fingers free, ah! That one got me through my thumb. Dang it. Ow. And now I'll knock the remainder of these bees in. Set this outside. Now I'll give these girls plenty of food. I've given them the equivalent of a furnished house, and they're moving out of a furnished apartment, so.
before long I'll have a couple beehives because I'll be able to split them into more than one. That's kind of one of the secrets to keeping bees and not busting the bank. Learning how to split one hive into two or three or four depending on how strong they are. That's how I've been able to go for five years on one hive. We'll see now that I have a bit more experience how long this hive will last. You know, I may have said this before, but the reason I keep bees is because of sugar. Uh, a few years ago, I started looking at our grocery bill every week and trying to figure out how can I make things on our grocery bill so that uh, we don't have to buy them. And obviously, one of them was sugar. And I thought, well, I could plant a whole bunch of maple trees and wait 40 years until I can get enough maple sugar. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute, I can keep bees. So that's actually why I started keeping bees was for the sugar, not for any other uh, environmental or uh, botanical reason, but just for the sugar. So um, it's been a really fun hobby. Um, and if you do it right, it doesn't cost as much as a lot of people say it does. It's just, you gotta be real careful if that's uh, something you want to avoid. But uh, it's uh, certainly something that's gonna come in even more important now without fossil fuels available. Uh, to work sugar beets and cane and other sources of uh, corn, other sources of, of uh, sweet sweetness into our diet um, aren't going to be available. So we're going to go back to basically medieval sweetener, which was honey. Um, cane sugar just wasn't available until the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to have to go pre-industrial honey and maple syrup and a lot less sweets in our diet. Um, I can already tell in the afternoon I don't have my sweet pick me up. I used to always have something sweet around four or five o'clock and I can definitely feel it in my body where it craves something sweet right now. So, well thanks for joining us for another week. We uh, had a lot more to do this week than last week and that's just how things go. Next week's gonna probably be even busier because we have to get all those starts uh, from the greenhouse into the ground once this frost danger is over. So you're gonna get to see um, all of that happening as well as, oh, probably chickens or the chicks getting uh, to go outside and some other things. So stay tuned for that. Uh, make sure you uh, subscribe below so that you will be sure to get that when it comes out probably next Friday. Um, send us to friends. Please do share us. That's really all we ask in exchange for uh, all these videos that we make. Um, and you can check out our blog at uh, lowtechinstitute.org. Uh, you can sign up to get that in your inbox, and uh, that will be things, not only food Mageddon related things, but also uh, other work we're doing here at the Low Technology Institute. So I hope you're all doing well and staying safe out there, and thanks for watching.